A very good day to you. I'm Howard Feldman. This is the Sunday Synthesis Podcast with me, Howard Feldman, and of course, Dr. Anton Myberg. It is the 29th of August in the year 2021, and we're still talking about COVID. I don't even know if we've finished the third wave yet. The numbers seem to be confusing. Our life is confusing. We don't know if this is ever going to end. And quite frankly, I've had enough of this. Dr. Anton Myberg, good morning. How are you? Please make Good morning. It Glad to see you're in a fantastic mood again this morning. Um, your poor oh, wife, they call me may she <laughs> take lots of Zainal. Oh, man. <laughs> okay, so there are currently 216 ca million cases worldwide with 4.5 million deaths and 193 million cases resolved. The United States has 39.5 million cases with 653,000 deaths. India has 32.6 million cases with 437,000 deaths. And South Africa has 2,757,191 cases with 81,461 deaths and 10,173 cases in the last 24 hours, an 18.1% test positivity rate. Gauteng has 3,869 patients currently in hospital with COVID with 693 in ICU and 395 ventilated. As you can see, the numbers are dramatically down in Gauteng. Western Cape and Northern Cape, the numbers are still extremely high, with the, the positivity rate being at 27 and 30% respectively. What does that mean, a positivity rate of 18%? Is, is, that, is that good? So that is good. It means we've breached or we've come down below the positive rate of 20%. Obviously, it's not good overall with the World Health Organization saying your positivity rate should be around 5%. So 18% is a very high number but it's below 20, and that's where we're going. We need to bring the numbers down. We need to care and vaccinating people, vaccinating, vaccinating. All right, so the other thing that's confusing for me is that, and I don't know if this wave is different to other waves, but we're seeing very distinctly different patterns or different stages of the patterns in the, in the different provinces. Shouldn't we at this stage be treating all of our provinces differently. In other words, if Gauteng is properly past its peak, which I'm not sure if it is or isn't, but Western Cape is still heading towards it, then surely we need to start, we need to have that flexibility instead of treating the whole country as one unit. Yeah, you see, I think that's, that's the major problem in the country because all the borders are open and because people can travel up and down between the provinces, You've got to maintain some sort of semblance of rules in order to govern the whole country. Until the actual positivity rate goes down below 12, 10%, I don't think it's feasible to do something like that. So right now, despite the fact that the numbers in Gauteng are looking excellent, the rest of the country, Western Cape, Northern Cape, they're in big trouble still. Because we're in the tell they're still in big trouble. And we do know that everybody is traveling freely between the provinces. So there's a higher chance of spreading the Delta variant between the provinces. And therefore, we can't really ease the restrictions in one province and, and not in the other provinces yet. Okay. We had a lot of questions about a new variant of interest. Personally, I'm not interested in another variant. I think we shouldn't have one. But, um, but, uh, but there is all this talk of a new variant of interest. What is this? So it's actually not new. It's, it is a variant of interest. It's called okay. C12. It evolved from the C1 variant, which was actually found during the first wave, which was last year in March, April. Oh. Um, it's been sort of found out in January 2021 that it was spreading throughout South Africa, but very minimally. But the problem with these variants of interest or these new sort of waves is that you take a, a gathering like RAGE and you've got a variant of interest and then it just pushes out the variant and then it just expounds the variant and promotes the variant. And then you've got a whole ke new kettle of fish, different type of resistance to different variants and a whole outbreak of new variants. So right now, this variant of interest, this new one, which is not really new, is sitting around, not doing much harm. It's here in a few provinces, it was in Mozambique, it's in all other countries in the world, but it's not really doing much damage. And hopefully, if we can keep going with our social distancing and decrease social parties and rage festivals and camps and things like that, then we won't promote it becoming a variant of concern. What do we know about it? Is it how different is it, for example, to the Delta variant? So it's not as, as transmissible as the Delta mm -hmm. variant. 
and right. it's not as as damaging as the delta variant yet right. but take a catalyst like a major function which can bring it out and drive the mutations of this variant and then we could land up in a whole different ball game right look i'm no um, i'm no detective but so far i'm picking up that you don't like the idea of rage i mean no, because no. considering you've mentioned it four times within four minutes roughly give or take <laughs> Subtly, that's very good captain uh, obvious yes yes not at all all right and and uh, let's just get that out of the way your advice to parents considering letting their kids go on rage if they're vaccinated because that's going to be the argument well my kid is vaccinated why can't they go on rage look the, the point of the matter is there's a lot of kids that aren't going to be vaccinated that are going on rage and the whole issue is we still don't know to this day that even if you are vaccinated, if you can transmit the virus to other people, if you can bring it home, it's going to lead into a whole different ballgame with people who are vaccinated early on in the year and then need booster doses down the line. So it's going to be a catalyst for an outbreak of a new variant or an existing variant at the time. Okay. Your advice is to parents, don't send your kids on rage, right? 100%. Okay, at least that's out the way. Hopefully we can uh, maybe discuss other things. Tell us about also lots of questions with regard to booster to booster doses. If you've had the Johnson & Johnson, should you try and, and get a Pfizer? If you've had the Johnson & Johnson, should you neither get a jo another Johnson? If you've had two Pfizers, do you get a third? Just bring us up to date with regard to the latest thinking and research in this regard, please. So we know that a single dose of Pfizer and AstraZeneca are about 30% effective against the Delta variant. After the second doses of the Pfizer, it's about 88% effective, and the second dose of the AstraZeneca, about 67% effective. So the risk of infection is much higher amongst people who are vaccinated earlier on in the year. Therefore, they've got a possible, possible relative decrease in their long-term protection. However, although booster doses should not be prioritized over people who have not been vaccinated, you know, surely you've got to look at the frontline healthcare workers who are working in the ICUs, who were vaccinated in February, who've now had a waning of the immunity eight months down the line, and you need to keep them protected because if you don't keep your frontline workers protected, then there's major trouble. I mean, already worldwide, there's been 9 million boosters administered, of which 1 million of those boosters were given in Israel. Uh, the United States, September the 20th, they're going to start rolling out their third boosters of the Pfizer. Um, and we know that the FDA has said that for immune compromised people, people are chemotherapy, people with solid organ transplants, people with dialysis, these are the people that need the booster doses. Now, a study came out in the last week or so from Johnson & Johnson saying that there's a nine-fold increase in your antibody production from having a second Johnson & Johnson booster. That still needs to be confirmed. We still need to wait for extra data regarding that. We do know, however, that we are going to need boosters down the line, whether it's six months down the line, eight months to the line, down the line, it's definitely going to be a necessity and we are going to need them. We've just got to wait to see when the government is going to give the go ahead. I know the medical associations have written to government and are pleading with them to vaccinate people who have been previously vaccinated in the first wave or, the, or in the first sort of vaccination rollout in January, February. Um, government are engaging it and we're waiting for further answers. You didn't say, you, you gave the efficacy figures for Johnson & Johnson and uh, for AstraZeneca and Pfizer. What are they for the Johnson & Johnson? So we're looking at somewhere between 70 to 80% with the Johnson & Johnson. They're still extremely high and 95% at least against hospitalization and severe disease. Once again, I think the important thing to mention is that no single vaccine is going to give you 100% effective prevention of hospitalization and death. We do know there are going to be breakthrough infections and some people are going to die, but it's the minority, we're talking a very, very small number, more than 95% of people will be protected by having the vaccine, will not need to go to hospital, will not need oxygen, and will not need to go on to severe medication. So, in other words, the, the vaccine is going to help to prevent serious illness and death. The, the chances are that we aren't going to eradicate COVID-19 in the way we would like to, in other words, 
just as as we did polio, for example, not for the next while. So this really was. Yeah, I, I think that's important. It's not a it's not a cure. Mm. It's a prevention mm -hmm. of you that if you do get sick, you don't get severely ill. The same as the influenza vaccine. Okay, before I continue with that, I just want to continue with this 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 thing around the booster shots that I know that I've asked the questions that I need to ask. You spoke also about two Pfizer's and then a third Pfizer, one Johnson and then another Johnson. What about the mixing of vaccines? In other words, if a healthcare worker has had the Johnson and Johnson, what are, what are your thoughts around them having the booster, but in the form of a Pfizer? Look, so the, the only studies that have been done was with the AstraZeneca and the Pfizer. And after AstraZeneca to have a Pfizer as a booster, we can extrapolate from that and say that there should be a great response having a Pfizer after a Johnson & Johnson or having a Johnson & Johnson. Once again, this is all, I don't even know if I can call it anecdotal because we don't have the actual data to work mm. on, but this is all things that we think will help and work and actually boost your immune response and boost the immunogenicity of your vaccine if you either mix and match or you have the same one. The, quite a few people have raised this point, and it's an interesting one. I'd love your thoughts on it. What do you think about differentiating the numbers, for example, of hospitalizations and death into vaccinated and unvaccinated? Don't you think that will help to show, to illustrate? Yeah, uh, I, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to do that, but I don't know where we're going to get the data from, and uh, I don't know if it's going to be considered as ethical to do that in other words you know right, would you right. would you take a hospital cohort and would you say this amount of people with pneumonia have got hiv and this amount of people with pneumonia don't have hiv or this amount of people with pneumonia are immune compromised and this amount aren't immune compromised so although we'd love to name and shame the anti-vaxxers and the people who aren't vaccinated yes we'd love to name and shame but i don't think ethically we can do something like that yeah i'm not even speaking about naming and shaming i'm not talking about using names i'm just just the data just to show that well of the the people hospitalized or of the the people that have died uh, in the last 24 hours from covid-19 you know out of the 100 90, 90 of them didn't have the vaccine or whatever it would be just to, to illustrate Look, i think if you look in the in the private hospitals it, it might be a difficult exercise because if you look at a medical aid like discovery where mm. the majority of their members are vaccinated, then it's very difficult to extrapolate numbers from that to say, you know, the unvaccinated versus the vaccinated. You've got to look at the whole population. You've got to look at private and um, public hospitals and see what the numbers are looking like. And from there, you need a whole data interpretation from that. And maybe that will come out at a later stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, the one thing I wanted to ask you as well is what is the story with uh, um, the, these antibodies? What do you call them? A mon mono, monoclonal so antibody. They're called monoclonal antibodies. And mm. they're very similar to the antibodies your body makes to fight viruses and other bugs, uh, except they're made in a lab and not made in your body. So they target the coronavirus spark protein. These monoclonal antibodies bind to the spark protein and then they block the virus from entering your body cells. Therefore, it can't make copies of itself and it can't spread further. So if you're already sick, it can prevent severe symptoms. And if you've been exposed to the virus, the monoclonal antibodies come along and they can fend off the virus and prevent you from getting sick. However, the vaccine is still far more effective than any monoclonal antibody in the fact that it helps stimulate and prepare your immune system to make the antibodies and to respond when you're exposed in other words, it creates the antibodies in your body before they actually even need it. So whereas the monoclonal antibodies will come and they'll boost the immune system after you're sick or after you've been exposed. But a vaccine does that much earlier and much easier and much better. The monoclonal antibodies are almost like targeted guided missiles that target and neutralize the virus. The problem with the monoclonal antibodies is that they don't stick around for long. So within three to four weeks, oh, they've okay. been digested in your system and they aren't there giving you that protection. Mm. And the important thing with the monoclonal antibody is the timing is extremely critical because for it to be effective, it needs to be given within the first four to five days of you getting infected. Then you can treat or you can prevent progression of the COVID-19 symptoms. 
Right. The same applies to some extent to remdesivir, doesn't it? You have to treat people very early. Yes. So, so remdesivir has to be given very early in your viral phase of your infection. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if it's given too far down the line, it won't really have a major effect. We still don't know if remdesivir decreases your mortality or it decreases your amount of stay in hospital. That being said, when it is given early with the with the corticosteroids and the right treatment, it definitely does show promise. Mm, and ivermectin, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm not really asking. Um, it, Wade wants to know, if, if there is a good amount of breakthrough infections and people who have been vaccinated, um, is if there's, if there's breakthrough infections of people being vaccinated, is herd immunity even a possibility? Are we still looking for herd immunity? No, once again, we're not looking for herd immunity anymore. We're looking mm. for effective vaccine control. We're looking to vaccinate the population so we can prevent the spread of the virus. In other words, we can vaccinate enough people that they don't land up in hospital, don't land up getting critically ill. Right. And uh, a few people asking, is life ever going to return to normal again? So I, I think we've got to look back and, and look back at a year ago and look back over the last 18 months, look where we are now. So obviously, I'm not talking about provinces like KwaZulu-Natal, Northern Cape, where things are rough at the moment. But looking at Gauteng now, things are starting to normalize in different ways. People are going out. People mm. are able to, to socialize a bit more. And things will return to normal. But I don't foresee things returning to normal until sometime in 2022, because we still will need a majority of our population vaccinated before we can get back to some semblance of normal. We're still going to we need to wear masks well into December. You know, there's there's talk of a fourth wave coming out in November, which is which is a very real thing. You know, because by November we still won't have enough people vaccinated to cover us from preventing a fourth wave. We do, however, hope that because so many people will be vaccinated, I mean, we're resting on over 11 million vaccinations and close to six million who are fully vaccinated. So, because there's a large amount of people that are starting to get vaccinated, that if and when there is a fourth wave, the Hospitalization, hospitalizations will be less and the severity of the disease will also be less, hopefully. But that said, the longer we take to do that, the more than we need to start with the booster shots because that's about this eight month period before we need to start. 100%. Already. And that's why these booster shots are going to be so important and so critical. Mm. But as I say, you know, you still need people to be vaccinated from a primary point of view before, you know, we can worry about booster shots for everybody. That being said, you know, every man for themselves these days, because if you don't get vaccinated, then, you know, you can't hold back other people. What about the under 18 years old? What is going on with us? Why aren't we talking about vaccinating? So I, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. I'm not quite sure why they haven't. But I mean, as I said, uh, the FDA have regulated the use of the uh, Pfizer vaccine in, in kids over the age of 12 years old, and the Moderna vaccine over the age of 18. Um, we should be vaccinating our 12-year-olds and upwards. No doubt in my mind. And no reason not to. No reason not to. We just got to get the go ahead, I suppose. From every reason to. Because these are the, these are, they, they're the kids, they're out there. They're socializing a lot more, more than we are. Yeah, I, I think that's a very good point because, and I think that's what's happening overseas is because kids aren't vaccinated, because adults are vaccinated, there's a greater spread at schools mm -hmm. and that type of thing because they aren't wearing masks because the teachers are vaccinated and then the kids don't think they need to wear masks as much. And there's been a breakdown in the communication of the actual rules of what people are supposed to do. But our next group of kids needs to be the ones over the age of 12 that need to be vaccinated. And, you know, it's all about education, about educating people how important it is because, yes, we know that the majority of young kids won't land up in hospital but they can still get inflammatory symptoms. They can still get the multi-system disorders. And more importantly, they can still transfer the virus to their parents or to their elderly grandparents. All right. I, I want to spend a moment. Next week is begins the Jewish high holidays. Lots and lots of festivals coming up. The truth is that, that what we're talking about applies to every 
religious gathering as well as every family gathering. Alan says, hi, please advise if possible. I'm going down to Cape Town to be with my family for the Jewish festivals. My granddaughter is seven, will still be at school. Do I assume no hugging, masks to be worn, social distancing? So what I'd like to do, if you don't mind, is break it up into the synagogue service, which, as I said, applies to all religious gatherings, and then the family gatherings, the meals when everybody wants to be together with family. Take us through those two areas, please. Okay. So where we're sitting today, the 29th of August, 2021, the rules are still that in any religious gathering indoors, you can have no more than 50 people, and religious gathering outdoors, no more than 50% of the amount of people, which is allowed to be about 100 people in an mm -hmm. area. Those are the rules. You can't have 51, you can't have 55. The coronavirus is too clever. It knows when there's an extra person there. Oh, those right. are the rules. You have to have 50 per right. religious service indoors. You know, it's remarkable, remarkable. With regards to having a family sort of social event, remember that the biggest spread of the actual virus is when people are eating together. And that you've got to be worried about. You can't have two families at the same table eating together without masks on. You still have to have separate tables. You've got to have six meters or you've got to have a few meters in between the tables. And you've got to make sure that people wear their masks for the majority of the meal, except when they're eating. Windows open, good ventilation. Everyone gets their own food packs. One person to serve everybody. Cold drinks in tins rather. You must prevent the spread of the virus as much as possible and be as careful as possible. And for grandparents seeing grandkids, still no hugging, no kissing. We've still got to go by those rules. We're still in the third wave in our country, despite it being less in Gauteng, there still is a fourth wave that could be coming. So we've still got to be extremely careful, albeit the fact that we can relax in some ways and actually have a family or two over for a meal. So you, what you're saying really is eating causes spread. There's no doubt about it because when people are eating and they're talking and you, you know, you know, you're, you're spreading your respiratory virus. Yeah, I was talking about that kind of spread, but I get it. Um, the going back to the going back to the synagogue service or religious gatherings, I don't think there's a regulation anymore with regard to timing. I know that last year it was strictly a two-hour limit. Would you still, however, encourage? shorter services and please say I think yes, it's mandatory got APD. from a yeah. social point of view that we have a two-hour service only no never more. mind from yeah. coronavirus the two-hour service is fantastic one of the positive things that came out of the pandemic hashtag two and a half hour services will fall right exactly no seriously is it is it better to have shorter services it is better to have shorter services you've got a collection of people together uh, you want to get those people in and out as quickly as possible. So it is better to have shorter services. Right. And in terms of on the Jewish festival of Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar, the, the, the ram's horn. Uh, there's, there's, I would imagine, some precautions around that as well. So the definitive precaution for that is that whoever is blowing the, the shofar has to stand either outside or at least six meters to buy an open window and blow towards that open window so they can't spread any of the aerosol from blowing the shofar because that would be a highly spread type mm -hmm. of thing to actually spread the aerosol. Still the same, All the as far as I'm concerned, all the uh, rabbis should be wearing masks when they give their sermons, um, but the sermon should be much shorter due to the shorter services. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, because COVID spreads when the service sermon is much longer. Uh, the, yeah, is, is the cold weather good or bad or irrelevant with regard to COVID? So the cold weather is bad from the fact that people all then congregate in one area with the windows closed. The, the warm, warm weather definitely is much better from a COVID point of view, from a spread point of view from people being more aware of their surroundings and being outside. All right, and uh, is there good news? So yes, so despite the cold, we entering into spring, which will, as we say, allow us to be outdoors and be much safer. The number of infections in the Gauteng are much lower. That doesn't mean we can now drop all our guards and we can not follow the rules anymore. 
Um, I've still got to be Dr. Doom and still say you still got to be careful and you still got to look after yourselves and you still got to protect each other. And then also the more important thing is the number of vaccinated people are starting to increase. The number of vaccinations on a daily basis are increasing dramatically. And that's largely due to community organizations throughout the country stepping up and playing the game. Mm -hmm. From a, a soccer point of view, uh, a difficult game for the Reds last night, but they still drew, they still got a point. Uh, even though it was against a parked bus, uh, you'll never walk alone. And to quote, sarcasm is the body's natural defense against stupid. Have a good week, be safe, and look after yourselves. Yeah, and that is exactly my motto. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Anton Marburg. As always, I'm Howard Feldman. This has been the Sunday Synthesis Podcast with me, Howard Feldman, and of course, Dr. Anton Marburg. Don't forget to subscribe below. Keep sending us your questions. We'll keep you as informed as we are able to. Have a great week. Stay warm, stay safe, and God bless.